Hi everyone, this is Green Sea Ships, and today I'm starting a program I call One Ship, One Day, in which I start in the morning building a radio controlled boat, moderately detailed, from scratch, from nothing but foam boards and pure raw materials, to completed, ready to sail radio controlled vessel before bedtime. And for this vessel, I've selected a ship called the Dominator. The Dominator is a Liberty ship that I first learned about many years ago from this book called Shipwrecks of Southern California by Bonnie Cardone and Patrick Smith. This is a great book for anybody who loves ships and shipwrecks in general. It's a book beach by beach, wreck by wreck of all the ships and shipwrecks along the coastline of, Cal of Southern California. And in one chapter covering the area around Long Beach, there's a, a segment on the SS Dominator. The SS Dominator was a Liberty ship built in 1944 as the SS Melville Jacoby. And in 1961, after passing, like so many Liberty ships did, into civilian ownership, the ship ran aground on the rocky shore of Palos Verdes, California, which is pretty much due west of Long Beach, and stranded there, unable to free herself. Eventually, with no way to get the ship off the rocks, the waves and surf just relentlessly pounded the ship into oblivion, and today there's very little wreckage recognizable on the beach. That is to say recognizable. The, sh the wreckage itself is littered all over the rocky beach at Palos Verdes. And it's a heck of a hike to get down there, but if you do, you can actually see some really cool stuff. I decided that I really wanted to build a, a model of the Dominator when a weekend ago, a friend of mine and I, on our trip to the Queen Mary in Long Beach, actually finally made the trek down to see the wreck of the Dominator. And it was then that I decided I really got to build a model of this thing. And in the spirit of Liberty Ships, I've decided I'm going to build this thing in record setting pace for me anyway. I'm going to start our program with the supplies and all the raw materials that go into making this ship. What you're looking at right now is a, pair of, a set of plans that I got from an eBay member called Dave's Dry Dock, who I get a lot of plans from, and this guy's great because he delivers plans for ship modelers. Not so much ship deck plans, etc., but plans for modelers showing emphasis on exteriors and details like that without loading you down with interior details. Things like that, which are useful for serious builders, which is not me. <laughs> and he has a store on eBay called Plans and Things. Plans-N-Things. And then, of course, my uh, reference book. There's lots of pictures you can find on Google of the SS Dominator and her wreck today. Not so many pictures of the ship before it became a wreck which is fine because it is a Liberty ship and there's tons of information on Liberty ships even um, these plans which you see here are a commercialized Liberty ship so I'm not getting loaded down with I don't have to remove the gun placements on the ship the temporary lifeboats and a lot of that sort of stuff that characterized a wartime Liberty ship I'll walk you over to the materials table this is our primary material. This is our steel that we're working from. It's, um, I've heard radio controlled airplane guys refer to it as Dollar Tree foam. It's a paper covered sheet board foam with paper sandwich of foam in between. The foam looks to be about um, 3 16 of an inch thick. It's actually pretty, fairly stiff thanks to the lamination of paper. If you took that paper away, it would be really flimsy but the paper keeps it fairly strong. So I've got some um, sizable chunks of this foam board. Uh, in the picture framing business, we call it foam core. What else have we got? We've got a plethora of razor blades. 
wood glue for the foam board. That's the nice thing about being paper covered. Wood glue works great. We've got wooden dowels. These thicker wooden dowels for the main masts and the thinner ones for the cargo booms. These are really popular items for quick and dirty scratch builders. Sprinkler system parts. These things are great from every, everything from anchor machinery to air vents or winches, that sort of thing. These things could probably do some small air vents. These things might be, with their wheels, might be good for anchor machinery. But uh, for more serious scale details, I go to Harbor Models where I picked up these air vents. These guys are brass and they're going to be a great size for most of the air vents on the ship. Then these guys are plastic, they're larger. And they come pre prefab like that, molded. Just need to be painted and glued in. Our paints. Now because this foam board is paper covered, it in itself is not, even though it's foam, it's not actually waterproof. This paper could peel if exposed to water. And because we're doing this thing quick and dirty, I mean, it is a Liberty ship, it's, going, it's waterproof protection is going to come completely from the enamel paint, particularly this paint. That's just enamel spray paint. I've used it before. Give a healthy coat on your foam board, and it actually works, as long as you don't chong the boat too badly. And that sort of thing, exposing the paper inside. It's pretty good, it's pretty effective at sealing the paper, which makes this foam core board completely waterproof. Coming back over to the electronic side, what do we got? We've got a small DC motor that I picked up from Fry's Electronics and put some, soldered some leads on there. A running hardware set comes from Dumas via Tower Hobbies. I'm using kit number 2371. This gives you the propeller shaft, the brass sleeve, the brass propeller, and the dog, nylon dog bone collar set which joins it to the motor. You see I actually I had to buy a separate universal adapter for the motor and that will provide a running hardware. I'm using this Taser 19 uh, forward reverse speed control and a because I'm an airplane guy I'm using a Spectrum AR6200 receiver probably don't need the satellite for this line of work but um, for the steering for the rudder I'm using a big old Futaba S3003 servo. I like to use these big standard servos even on a smaller job for the rudder because the micro servos I was using with my airplanes just don't give me the rudder throw that would satisfy me on a boat. So that's pretty much all of our supplies that go into building this thing. And if I'm forgetting anything you'll probably see it used during the build. The time now is nine, nine o'clock sharp and we are ready to get to work on our first cuts. We'll be cutting the side panels of the hull. We have to enlarge them in certain places to account for the curvature of the hull as we warp the hull into a shape of a boat and cutting the two sides and then the flat bottom of the waterline. This is another thing I need to point out. This is going to be a waterline model not a full hull down to the keel, as you'll see. So we're gonna cut the, t the three major sections of the hull and get them ready for joining. Quick little check-in to show you the progress on joining the hull. I have one half of the hull, one side panel of the hull cut, and I just bend the strip over the straight edge of a of a table or door frame even to curve it into that shape as you see there and then here's one that hasn't been crimped yet for a contrast and then once I've got both panels cut 
and glued together at the stem, the bow, I'm ready to put it down onto the foam that's going to be the flat bottom and trace one side of the hull where it meets the flat bottom. Then duplicate that to the other side of the center line for symmetry. And there you can see my center line drawn with pencil. So now we've got all three pieces cut, dry fitted as you see here, and we're ready to glue and tape them together to form the hull. I'm leaving the very back of the stern open like this because I plan to make the very fantail of the ship out of solid blue one inch foam, like this sort of stuff that you get from the hardware store. I'm gonna make it make the stern solid foam so I can get that rounded shape just right. It's kind of hard to do that with this flat foam board. Okay, so it's glued together, and because of the enamel paint we'll be using, we're able to do silly things that we normally wouldn't think of doing with water, such as using masking tape along the seam. But that'll all be sealed up as well and made waterproof by the paint. Now, the masking tape also adds just a little bit extra protection to the most vulnerable areas of the ship, the corners of the hull, against as you set it down next to the water or pick it up or set it down on a table or anything. The little bangs and scratches that can happen on there just makes it just a tiny little bit tougher and able to withstand those things. Okay, so it's already past 10 and construction of the hull is dragging on a little longer than I thought, but we're getting there. Here is the hull, the sides and the bottom, and what you see here is I'm actually just gluing a two layer thick block of foam onto the stern with a pop five minute epoxy. Once that is dry, I just take a belt sander to it and I sand the tar out of this block until it acts and shapes the way the stern ought to. Okay, so the assembly of the hull took probably longer than I thought, but this is really the major work of building the model, so I'll deal. Here we have the hull. The belt sanding and hand sanding on the foam stern is done, and we have from stem to stern a complete hull. I had to throw in a little extra bulkhead in here and epoxy that in place to make sure, because the waterline part of the hull was trying to squeeze the upper deck together and I needed to force it back out a little bit to give me reasonably scale looking decks. So here she is. Unfortunately, I left this space of the stern um, too wide from what it needed to be. So to avoid just a completely blunt stern end, I added an extra bit of foam on here, making her three quarters of an inch longer than she really needed to be for scale. So whereas a typical Liberty ship is 441 feet long, this thing in scale feet would be about 450 feet, so sue me. Anyway, but uh, there you can see how the belt sanding and uh, some of the hand sanding went back there. I mentioned that I'm going to paint this thing with enamel spray paint, and I am for waterproofing. However, even the enamel spray paint will melt the exposed block foam that I used on the stern. So I'm going to use a different product for uh, waterproofing that area. It's uh, from Minwax. I use the spray version. It's called Polycrylic. Polycrylic will waterproof foam and it, it will waterproof anything. It will prefer waterproof cardboard, lots of different things. It will waterproof it uh, depending on the material. You just have to use thicker or thicker coats. Uh, for foam, it won't have to take too much. But this does more than just waterproof. It allows you to spray paint on top of foam. If you give a heavy enough coat, you're sealing the foam and protecting it against spray paint. So use water-based Minwax Polycrylic um, you can use it in liquid form or in spray form, but I'm going to coat this block of foam pretty good in that polycrylic, and after it dries, I'll be ready to spray paint over it, as well as the rest of the foam. And then we can start moving on to the decks and the superstructure and the really fun stuff. Before I get into that, I thought I'd just do a quick point out 
This is how I'm going to match the size of the main deck. I just simply flip the boat over, upside down, put it on the piece of foam that's going to become the deck, and I trace the hull, subtracting the thickness of foam core from my tracing to arrive at the proper dimension for the deck that fits inside the hull. Okay, so we're coming up on 11 o'clock, it's 10.50 now, and while I wait for the foam, save, the foam protecting polyacrylic to dry outside, I went ahead and cut the main deck, and as you can see I painted it in kind of a red oxide primer color that was popular on merchant ships of the post-war era, and I've cut several hatches, several of the scale hatches out, and for various reasons to access the hull. This is the aft deck house, and that's right about where the rudder itself will be. And then this aft hatch, immediately forward of it, that's where the rudder servo is going to go. Here's the main superstructure is going to go here in this opening, and that's where the motor uh, propeller shaft is going to come up into the hull. Battery may be in there as well, radio, receiver, speed controller, all that good stuff. And I cut one of the hatches in the bow out because I may end up needing to put some ballast in there to make up for all the weight in the stern. So as soon as the hull comes in and gets painted, this deck will be ready to go in and then we can start getting onto the superstructure. So hopefully I can have, the, f the morning was devoted to the hull and the afternoon will be devoted to the superstructure and machinery. Okay, we're already two hours after starting and I finally brought the hole back in, nice and dry back there with the polycrylic, and I went ahead and started spraying the top of the foam there, the same color as the deck, and then the rest of the hull is ready to, ready to paint. I went ahead and painted the deck and I cut my hatches while I was waiting for all that stuff to dry. The hatches are just, uh, take a couple layers of that foam board. I take the cutout from where I cut the hatch out, take the cutout, then bolt that to a larger piece of foam, then a little piece of mat board um, to the top to make that hatch. And it just fits into place because I used that cutout. Just like this one will fit into place over here. So, here we are, it's 10 past 11. We're ready to paint the black of the hull. And after that, we'll glue the deck down and then we can start on the superstructure. All right, time now is 11.21 a.m. And the painted deck hull is back in the shop, but it's still a little tacky to the touch and I'm not ready to go ahead and manhandle that thing enough to get the deck glued down. So I've decided what I'm gonna do now is move ahead on the sub-assembly then of the superstructure and get started there while I wait for the paint to dry. So just like a Liberty ship, no time is wasted and we'll keep going forward with other stuff while we wait for that to dry and it'll all just come together as sub-assembled like the real thing was. Before I get into building the superstructure, I'm going to introduce you to another material that I've already used on the on the cargo hatch covers. It's called matte board, and this is a picture frame material. We use it for making picture frame mats. It's very thin, as you can see from my fingers here. I have to use this in the particularly on the upper decks because the foam core I'm using is just so thick that just won't make for scale thickness of decks where you actually see the edge of the deck and you can see how thick or thin it is so I have to switch to this thinner material it's still pretty firm but it is much thinner and that is just really essential it's hard to cut harder to cut it straight with scissors I have to use razor blades to cut this stuff it's very dense basically very dense paper is all it is and 11.30 and it's already time to change gears again because I've determined that the hull is dry enough now that I can go ahead and put the main deck in. And now I've got this 
lower level superstructure deck painted and it needs time to dry. So we're gonna bounce right back to the hull. Oy, well, that uh, could have been prettier. It could be prettier, but uh, I did it. I ended up fitting the deck into place and then welding it, if you will, with CA glue along the edge there because uh, any other kind of glue would be visible. Well, much more visible anyway. And squeezing it into place, it would have scraped against the beveled edge there, smearing glue all over the place, and it would be even uglier. So, we got it. Main deck is in place. We're ready to start talking superstructure. And it is about 11.42, 11.43 in the morning. Okay. I'm going to pause for a moment and show you do the doing of the walls of the superstructure. Very simple, actually. I've cut my strip of superstructure wall. I use the foam board. Um, the, the correct height according to the plans, which I have enlarged here to full, sky, full scale of the, of the model, 4 to 1 inches long, so that I'm able to translate directly to the plans. And I use... A combination of Sharpie pen for the round portals, then ballpoint pen and a small straight edge. I'm using a, a mat knife or for the doors here and a ruler for the railing. So with a pen, I just draw the railing and the doors in like that by hand. And on a ship this simple, it's it works and that's all you really need. Okay, so 12.08, just past uh, three hours since we started, and we have the hull, and the first deck of that superstructure is loosely in place. I say loosely because it's not latched down by any means. I went ahead and just test fit where the rudder servo is going to go, and approximately where the motor is going to go. Prop shaft will be exiting the boat somewhere around this area under the hatch there. And then rudder servo and rudder itself will go right around there. But uh, yeah, there's the first deck of the superstructure. And this hatch will be, I'm going to put a little rim inside here that fits just inside the opening there. So you just put it over on top of there. And that keeps it from sliding around this way and that. But yeah, there she is, 12.08. Um, Union says I gotta stop to have a lunch break. So we're gonna let the lurker, wor workers le rest while we go get something to lunch on and resume work. But yeah, there it is. Breaking for lunch and we've got the hull and first of the superstructure done. Okay, we're after lunch, we've gotten settled and we're back to work. Uh, I just thought I'd pop in real quick and show the prefabbed superstructure before the walls are glued in place. Actually, what's gonna glue these walls together is the deck on top here, because I have to make sure that all the corners are square and proportions are right, angles are right, before I glue it down to the deck. So I'm actually going to work up from the top down cutting the deck above that with the bridge wings that will go out here and here and then glue that down to the walls and then glue the whole thing flip it over and glue it down under the deck below I believe that's actually how they built the real things or at least portions of the superstructure another hour has gone by so I'll bring you up to speed on the new developments the uh, raised superstructure right there is prefab, just resting there in place on gravity. And then here's the aft superstructure. Just comes off of there, and those brackets there, the foam, just hold it in place so it won't wiggle side to side. And then here's that structure. Those rectangular windows drawn by hand with a Sharpie coming along just plugging my way through the decks 
Okay, after, after 2.30. And quick progress update. These little structures around the masts have gone in. And they're a bit tedious. Pretty small, but still have to have four walls. Still have to have portals. Still have to have doors. And got the main masts, cargo masts, cut to the right heights. They look pretty short to me, but the plans insist that they're only supposed to be about that high. It's kind of hard to see them against the white wall. Or what used to be a white wall. Okay, so now it's past 3 o'clock. And we're still not quite ready to glue down the superstructure block. But what I've done is I've made with card paper and glued around the edges some railing around the bridge, some of that solid railing. I'm thinking later to add photo etched, oh, careful there, to add photo etched railing around the rest of the superstructure. Uh, I've ordered some photo etched railing in the proper scale, but it hasn't arrived yet, so that could be a retrofit for later. I've started the smokestack, the funnel. This little thing is made out of that same foam board, crimped on the edge of a, like the hull, crimped on the edge of a sharp corner table or something, and curved into a tube, taped, and then glued. So that'll sit right there, like that, in the finished boat. Funnel's ready for painting. I just threw a couple little uh, dowel cutouts on top there to give it a chimney-like effect. Okay, so it's 3.37 now, and the big update is we got air vents. These brass air vents, which actually, as I sanded them down, turn out to be aluminum. Um, some of them are quite fragile. These guys, for example, because they're on top of mat board, I couldn't drill through the mat board to give them beddings. So they're just sitting on there, held in place only by CA glue at their bases. So let's take it easy on those guys. The ones down on the deck, they actually punched through the deck a little bit. So they've got a little bit of footing. But uh, yeah, now I got air vents. All right, before I actually install it, some words about the funnel. Um, all I have for information on the Dominator's funnel is this picture, this black and white picture, and it shows a white cross on the funnel and a band that seems to go off to the sides no colors, no idea, and I have not been able to figure it out. I know that the owners of the vessel at the time that it was grounded were Greek, so I just decided paint it blue with a white cross and emulate the Greek flag. If uh, anybody knows any better, I'd love to hear it. And with that, at 3.43 p.m., I am ready to take this subassembled super block of superstructure here and install it on the ship. Okay, so it is 4.12, no, 4.13 in the afternoon, and we're at a point now in detail wise where we're ready to get in there and tackle our guts. Put the motor in, the prop shaft, rudder, rudder servo, and actually get her guts going. Uh, one last detail thing I did here, um, I added with white electrical tape, I added the special white band to the Dominator's hull that was fairly unique to the Dominator as far as Liberty ships go, and painted the giant air vents around the, the base of the funnel. From the photograph I have in the book, they appear to be kind of the same shade of gray as the funnel itself. So I figured if I, since I made the funnel blue, I gotta make the, fun, the air vents blue as well. And there you see that unique, it looks like a, a water break, but actually the hull line 
continues over the black area and it's just a white pinstripe that goes underneath it all the way back there. So let's see how how expeditious we can be about getting her motor and speed controller and rudder all that stuff going. Okay it starts with the propeller shaft installing that I've taken the liberty of screwing the propeller onto the shaft itself here's the brass sleeve for it and uh, that Dumas kit did actually it's kinda neat to have such a meaty brass propeller I'm used to using two bladed nylon propellers on ships of this size but uh, this on its sleeve and here's the hole on its side I'm just gonna that's where the superstructure is it's just gonna get poked in the hole center poked in the hole center line of the bottom at an angle enough to clear on the inside but also clear the propeller for the bottom of the hull and um, I'll just have to figure that out as I slug it out Okay, it's 4.26 p.m. and got the propeller shaft in there and by leaving the propeller in place I've found just the right angle will clear the bottom of the hull and just when all else fails throw epoxy at the problem. The entire slat that I cut out has been filled in with epoxy and smothered with epoxy and that epoxy is going to hold the propeller shaft at a fixed angle for as long as it lives. Okay, so it's 439 now. Not a lot to do while the glue dries, but there you can see the motor mount block that's going to hold the motor at just the right angle and its proximity to the propeller shaft. And this, what you see here, this nylon we call the dog bone with the pegs in it, that's the part of the universal connector setup. It goes into another brass connector on the motor itself and the motor turns the dog bone which turns the other connector on the propeller shaft and that way you can have some error, some plus or minus error in the angle or alignment of the motor, it's no problem. Four forty-five now and the motor mount is installed with the motor in place. Use some epoxy in there at the bottom just because I don't want to wait for the wood glue to dry. And if you see inside there with next to the motor, I added some act actually electrical tape to the sides where the motor is squeezed into the foam core mount to, um, to add a little traction to avoid the motor from slipping over time as it heats up or expands or whatever so just added some electrical tape to give it some extra grip and the motor mount is you can see how the universal coupler works I'm going to turn the propeller even though it's not in alignment it's fine alright so it's almost 5 p.m. and got everything hooked up we're going to do a little bench test um, got the ESC in there, battery is out. This is a two cell LiPo. Don't do more than two cell on this setup or you'll puff your battery. That is a two cell LiPo, 2200 milliamp. And all we got hooked up is the motor, but we're gonna throw the switch, the throttle anyway. See a lot of wobble there, but under these light loads, it's uh, not going to be an issue. So she's ready to run. She's just not ready to steer. Okay, so now it's 6:25 and. After another union mandated meal time, we are back to work. And I have installed the rudder servo. It's just sitting there on a bed of hot glue. 
I can still reach the screw for the control horn. I've put an easy connector on there to make life easier when I'm adjusting the control rod to the rudder. Everything's still good there. So we're ready to install the rudder and after we install the rudder, this thing's ready to be tested in the water. Now building the rudder, I'll try to walk you through it for people who haven't done it before. This is just the way I do it. I know it's not the best way, but it's the way I do it. Anyway, I start with one of these um, control rods you get from the ho hobby shop. It's threaded there on the end with this nylon clamp grip. What I do is I'll show you. There's a tube of the aluminum tube for the rudder. I try to I poke it through the back here and then I seal the area around it with epoxy so it's it's uh pretty stiff there. And I try to rise it up as much as I can to get it as high in the air uh, without getting too close to the deck above it or the hatch or whatever. Then I take the control rod turn rudder post and I bend it along the top there and that differential becomes my tiller. At this point everything down there is still straight. After that, after that, I cut a piece of music wire of the right diameter that it just barely fits inside the hole on that easy connector. Cut it the length that it needs to be to go back to the rudder. Then I take a piece of, cut up a piece of plastic. Don't laugh, I know this is really ghetto the way I'm doing this. Um, cheap, easy, simple, crude. <laughs> but I cut a little piece of plastic here and drill a hole through it. This, uh, this I'm going to affix with a tape as firmly as I can to the rudder push rod. Then once that's done, this hole will get clamped on and by that clamp. And that becomes the push-pull of my rudder, as you'll see. Yes, that's masking tape. But crude, but in my experience, effective. Allows the rudder servo to do its thing, causing the rudder to do its thing. Okay, you'll see next what I did here, now that all that is hooked up, I took some pliers, vice grips, whatever you can, and I bent a sharp 90 degree angle on this. This is, then I'm gonna cut my rudder paddle out and fit it in here, and that becomes my rudder. This right here becomes the strength of the rudder during turning. And then obviously I'll trim off the excess. and you're looking at the rudder. It's got to be made of something stiff, plastic. Um, I work in picture framing so I get a lot of plexiglass around and I just cut the rectangle of the rudder out of that. You can use anything as long as it's firm enough and waterproof. And it goes in there like that and it will be duct taped along both sides because there's just no glue I use that's that will work well to metal in plastic. And, well, let's face it, it's not a lot of pressure, duct tape works fine. Like so, there is the rudder in place. Spinning freely because I haven't hooked it up to the servo yet. Which I'm ready to do now. Right then, it is 7.02 p.m., 10 hours after work began, the first cutting, and we are all hooked up, rudders hooked up, motors hooked up, radios on, we're ready to switch on and see if she responds. 
Okay. We got a heartbeat. We got a rudder. Well, there is nothing to do but put her in the water and see see how she runs. Well, okay, I said almost nothing else to do. These you see here are, I told you guys that I had gone to visit the wreck of the Dominator on the beach at Palos Verdes. Well, these two pieces are little flakes of rusted steel that I picked up uh, from the Dominator wreck and they're going to be hot glued into the cargo hold of the model. So we have some small insignificant piece of the real ship inside the model. And there they are. The metaphorical heart of the ship. See you at the lake. All right, well, here we go. Set her down here without falling in, preferably. And there she goes. The SS Dominator. From completely scratch raw materials to radio controlled boat in 11 hours. To be fair, I still have a lot more detail I want to add. I mentioned the railing. There's also more deck machinery, lifeboats, davits. There's more to be done. And I will do it tonight. But I think this is a good place to leave the program with the Dominator built and on her way on her maiden voyage. See you next time, folks.